I'm Brandon Birdall. We're here at Birdall Sawmill, and we specialize in supplying natural edge slabs and high quality lumber to furniture makers, woodworkers, architects, designers. So in 2009, when we started, I had seen a lot of pecan trees in the area because of the drought that had died. And most farmers were just pushing brush up at the base of them and burning them. And so I was kind of looking around at all these trees that were just gonna rot and get and burn and say, couldn't we use that for something? So our process obviously starts with a log. We don't process a log unless it meets our quality specification. That's the first step. If it passes that, then we take it to one of our mills. We saw it on one of our two bandsaw mills. And then after that, the slabs or lumber are placed on what we call kiln sticks or stickers. So those are little boards in between the layers that allow it to properly air dry. And most of our materials air dry from six months to two years. And then it goes into one of our two computer controlled kilns. After it comes out of the kiln, it's typically surfaced either in this wood shop or on our big 100 inch wide joiner. And after that's done, it's stored in a humidity controlled building. What sets our product apart is the quality. It just all boils down to that. We do every single step ourselves from the time the log comes in to the time it goes out the front door. We have complete quality control over everything. And the people that work here all understand wood. And that makes us produce a product that's superior. One of the greatest things in being able to work with Brandon and what he produces over here is the slabs that you get are not only dry, but they are flat and I've had slabs of his at my shop standing for months and they don't move, they were dried right, they stay flat. Uh, I've never had an issue with uh, splitting, cracking, or, or any of that. They've just been really good to work with. We're really passionate about what we do. It's, it's a lifestyle, you know. I live right here on the property. My kids come down here and they play. The way we treat our employees and stuff, it's, it's about doing something that we enjoy and doing a really good job at what we do. After we've cut a log, years and years later, we can go see that piece of furniture. Our customers call us and say, hey, I've been enjoying this table for the last four or five years. It's so wonderful. And everybody that comes in our house comments about that. And that just brings a lot of joy to us that we've taken a tree that would have rotted or been burned. The fact that those, those tables will be around two, 300, 400 years from now is really satisfying to me. Thank you, sir. Thanks. First off, I would like to say thank you so much for having me. I feel really, really honored to be here. Uh, we had a great tour at our facility about six months ago. I wish I could just pick everybody up and, and go to the mill and uh, ho hopefully that video helped out. Um, what I would like to do today is give you a small backstory about myself. I'm a pretty simple guy, so it won't take very long. Uh, and then about what we do and kind of some goals that I had starting out and how we're able to take trees and preserve them and turn them into furniture. So uh, a little bit about myself. I grew up about 20 miles from here um, on a pecan farm in Cedar Creek uh, that my parents had for a long time. And so um, it was a lot of fun on the farm growing up, uh, learning how to build things and being creative. My dad was very mechanically minded. And um, I got in on a lot of that stuff as a kid. And then in my teen years, I was dead set on being a professional baseball player. And that's pretty much what all my energy and time went into. I uh, battled a lot of injuries and things like that, um, but I thought I could work through them. When I was about 20 years old, I was drafted by the Atlanta Braves and thought I was going to be a Major League Baseball player. Um, and then after that, I continued to have uh, injuries and just my body was not made to be a baseball player. So I said, I need to go to school and get a real job. So I went to Texas A&M and graduated construction science. Um, I thought I wanted to build homes because I, I like enjoyed, enjoyed building things. So I went and did that. And um, during my time there, I did an internship and figured out that that really wasn't for me. There were things that I liked about it, but I wasn't really passionate about it, and it just didn't really solve my needs. Um, so I, after college, I returned to the pecan farm. I worked there for about a year for my parents, and uh, my dad was kind of encouraging me to take over the farm and, uh, and do that, and I, I worked there about a year, and I liked some things about it. I liked building things and being creative, but it just wasn't, I wasn't passionate about it, and I didn't want to be a farmer. Um, 
And my dad said, you're crazy. This place is already set up for you. All the trees are in, the irrigation is in. I've already figured all out all the problems. Like, it'd be so easy for you. And I said, you know, I don't really like it. Um, I, want, I want to do something else, you know? So um, my wife and I sat down, and we, we had a lot of discussions. And I came up with four things that I really wanted um, out, of, out of a job. I said, one, I want to make enough money to live comfortably. That was the first goal. And all, all four goals are this, uh, equal of importance, none are over the top of each other. Um, I had been around people that had made a lot, a lot of money, and I thought they sacrificed other things in their life, other areas, you know, time or time with their kids or moving or something like that to, to make a lot of money. So I said, you know, I, really, I don't really want that, but I want to live comfortably. So that was number one. Um, number two is I wanted to do something that I thought was honest and ethical. So I wanted to provide something, some service or some good to somebody that when they walked away, I could say, okay, I'm proud of that. Uh, I think that comes from my parents. Um, from, you know, from an early age, they instilled that in me. Uh, I don't think I really had a choice um, from that. And then I wanted to do something where I didn't have to move from city to city. Um, I kind of anticipated doing construction in college. And I saw a lot of my friends, you know, they went to Denver, they went to New Mexico. And I said, you know, I have family in this Austin area and I just really don't want to be, have to move a lot. And I want to be able to spend a lot of time with my kids. Uh, we didn't have kids at the time, but I knew if I brought a child in this world that it was my responsibility to spend a lot of quality time with them. Um, and the last one was, I, really, I want to do something that I really, really enjoyed. Every single day when I got up, I wanted to go do something that I had a lot of fun. I had a mentor, oh, his name was Wendy Fullwood, that uh, really encouraged me. He said, find something that you love to do and everything else will fall in place. Um, so that's kind of kind of the backstory, you know. So one day I was driving on the pecan farm, and I in the in the previous months I had seen some like live edge tables, some big slab tables, and they were like eight or ten thousand dollars, you know. And I was driving along, and I looked over at our neighbor's pasture, and he had a big pecan tree. It was about four feet in diameter, and it was dead. There weren't any green leaves on it. And I looked at that tree, and I remember the tables that I saw for like eight or ten thousand dollars, and I was like, hmm dead tree table that's pretty easy you just got to figure it out you know um, so I went to my neighbors and I said what are you gonna do with that tree and he said I guess I'm just gonna push and brush up against the bottom of it and burn it and I said would you be willing to let me come in and cut it cut it down and haul it out for you and he said how much are you gonna charge me and I said nothing he said great you know uh, so I went I went home and I told my wife I said this might be for me I said look there's dead trees everywhere. The drought had, this was about in 2008 when, um, when I look, was looking around. The, the drought from like 05 to 07 had killed lots and lots of trees in the area. There was bunch, lots and lots of them that were dead everywhere. And I said, these people are just pushing brush up against the bottom of them and burning them. Um, and my, my dad sold about 50,000 nursery trees to farmers all around Texas. And they were doing the same thing. When they needed to plant an orchard, they cleared the field and pushed them all in a pile and burned them. And I said, I'm sure my dad can put me in contact and I can get this huge natural resource that people are just burning and turn it into something. And we can preserve the trees that, you know, instead of going into ash, they can be a big slab table that somebody can really, really enjoy for years, hundreds of years, you know? Um, so start looking around, I told her, I said, you know, I probably can have a shop by the house, so I won't have to move. Um, I can wear this type of clothing to work every day. I won't have to wear a suit. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is why I wore this, because this is what I've I worn for 10 years. Um, I have little stacks of Wrangler jeans and Wrangler shirts. When, the ones that have holes in them I normally wear to work, and then when I need to come to something like this, I, I pick the better ones. So, you know, you're, you're getting the real me today, you know? So, um, so we looked around and kind of did some market research, and I said, I, I think this might solve my four problems. You know, like, if I can make, find, a, find a way to make a comfortable living, I know it's honest and ethical. I mean, building somebody a table can't get much better than that. I could spend a lot of time with the kids, you know, and it's something that I would really enjoy. Um, so that was the, the part about preserving the natural resource. And then it was just time to get creative. Like there's a standing tree, somebody needs a table. And we you just have to figure it out. So once that log is on the ground, you know, the first one we cut down, it weighed 12,000 pounds. And you have to get it on a trailer with a tractor that I borrowed from my dad that only would pick up 2,000 pounds. So cables, winches, ramps, you know, pick up one in, slide it, figure it out. You know, like, so it had to be, all those things had to be figured out. And then once you get it to the, you know, to where you're going, at the time, nobody made a commercial, a commercial sawmill that you could purchase to cut a log that large in diameter. So I went to my neighbor's house and said, hey, I've got this tree. I need to make a sawmill to cut it. He said, oh yeah, that's easy. We can do that. 
So we built a, a mill to saw up big logs. Uh, and then once, once we milled it up, we're like, we have to get it dry. And that's a process that there is no written literature on if you cut up a con slab three inches thick, you can't go to a piece of paper and say, this is how you should dry it. It's just something that had to be figured out. So we built our own kilns, uh, all of our computer controls and everything. Um, just a big learning process about being creative on how to go from a tree to a table. Um, and then once, once they were dried, I said, you know, people, they always warp a little bit during the drying process. And so I said, they need to be flat because people want to eat on a flat table. Uh, there was not a machine to surface four foot wide, you know, or bigger slabs. So my neighbor and I built a machine to surface big slabs of wood. Um, so it's been a really fun um, adventure, you know, uh, of trying to figure all those things out and being able to preserve um, a natural resource. So basically that, that was 10 years ago. So now today we're able to take trees from power lines, pipelines, roads, bridges, farmers that uh, clear their fields, just trees that have died, uh, Hurricane Harvey, we got hundreds and hundreds of logs from Hurricane Harvey in gravel plants, sand and gravel mines, they commonly dig out um, lots and lots of trees and take them out because they have to get sand to make cement, so we repurpose them from there. A couple of examples that I brought, um, this is a slab from a tree that was growing at Laguna Gloria Art Museum off 35th Street. So there were a lot of people married underneath this tree and it, the tree was so declined that they had to remove it and we were able to get some of it. So now somebody can make this into a coffee table. You know, maybe they got married under the tree. They could look at a coffee table from the tree where they were married instead of this thing just getting chipped or taken to the landfill, which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, that right there is a big ingrain disc from a pecan tree that's about 170 years old. So that's pretty neat that something like that, that's that historic, we can preserve that and, um, and put it to use and make something out of it. So it's really, really fun. So it's been a great run. And um, I kind of look back at the four goals that I had when I started, you know, like I wanted to make a comfortable living. So I kind of like look back at those and say, okay, yeah, I am making a comfortable living. Uh, I'm not getting rich. The, the pickup truck that I drove today has 312,000 miles. It's like 20 years old, but uh, my commute to work is about a hundred yards. So. <laughs> Uh, I don't typically use it. I use the golf cart if I'm lazy, um, or if I need a little bit of exercise, I walk. Um, so I don't, I don't really need um, an expensive truck, you know? And I don't really need a lot of money. Uh, you can't take it with you. I say you've never seen a hearse, uh, a hearse with a luggage rack, you know? So uh, I think that's, that's one thing. Um, as far as the honest and ethical part of it, uh, I really believe like what we're doing is an honest thing, uh, you know, saving our natural resources and when somebody walks out of our wood shop, whether the piece of wood is $5 or $5,000, they get a good value. I mean, they get every bit of what they pay, it's worth. And um, I think in 1955, Albert Einstein um, was about, about two months before he died, a reporter for Life Magazine went to, to, went to interview him at his house and the, and the reporter took his son with him. And the son asked Albert Einstein, can you give me a young man some, some like life advice? And Einstein told him, he said, try to be a person of value. Don't try to be a person of success because a person of value gives more than they take. A person of success takes more than they give. Um, and I really, really believe that that's a great way to live and think about being a person of value. And I really believe the things that we're doing and the products that we're providing, the services provide a good value to somebody. I mean, we sell slabs for up to $12,000 a piece. And when they go out the door, they're worth every bit of it. Uh, we firmly believe that. Um, as far as not having to move um, from city to city, I don't. Um, you know, <laughs> my, my shop and, and house are about 100 yards apart, and I don't uh, go any more than about 100 miles from the shop to get trees. So um, that's been very, very nice. And spending time with my kiddos um, it has been amazing. Um, I've made it to all their baseball practices, um, football practices, coach their teams. Uh, and all that kind of stuff. When, uh, when three o'clock rolls around, we know that the kids are gonna come down to the shop and start building ramps and building jumps and um, you know, annoying all the people that work around there. Um, <laughs> my, my wife, uh, they like to spray paint rocks. I give them cans of spray paint, let them spray paint, you know? And my wife called me one day and she said, uh, do you know that Clay has six of our employees out looking for blue rocks? And I said, yeah, that's fine, just let him do it. Um, <laughs> uh, 
because it's, it's just good atmosphere. You know, they're, they're able to play and do some fun stuff. Um, but I really firmly believe that I've been able to achieve those goals um, because I enjoy what I do. Um, that's, that's the main, if you had to pick the four things, I'd say uh, that's the biggest one for me. Um, because honestly, I'm not that smart. I'm not that talented. Um, my seven-year-old brings home his homework and I have trouble with the spelling, helping him out. Honest, I mean, I'm a terrible speller. Um, I think I have been smart enough to find people that are smarter than me. Uh, has been a big one. Sydney Buford over there is one of them. Um, that's helped us out a lot. Um, but I think if I, if I didn't enjoy what I was doing, I wouldn't be good at it. And you know, um, I work really hard, but it doesn't seem like work to me. It's just like a big game, really, honestly. It's just a big game that we play every day that we have a lot of fun at. Um, and we're able to take stuff like this. Um, I brought this, this is a commercially made piece of plywood, but plywood has been found in Egyptian tombs from 3500 BC. So 5,500 years ago, there was a tree standing somewhere in Egypt and somebody cut it down and they sawed it into little pieces and probably planed it. They glued it, to, glued it together with hide glue from animals and wooden pegs, and 5,500 years later, it's still good. So literally, the, the, ta the things that we produce and the, the people that buy wood from us, what they produce, they will be around forever if, long as, if they're kept out of the sun and kept out of the rain. And it's pretty cool that you can take a tree that was gonna get mulched, burned, bulldozed, any of those things, and turn it into something that will literally last thousands of years. Um, by preserving our natural resources and being creative. Um, you know, I said, well, I have two, I have, I have three, three small children, Clay's seven, Emily's four, and a little, a little boy that's five months old. And we literally pass up on healthy living trees that we see all the time. And I, I think, okay, maybe one of these days, uh, a hurricane will knock it over and maybe Clay can harvest this tree or Emily can harvest this tree. Um, there are so many natural resources, especially in our industry, you don't have to cut something that's healthy and living. I mean, go look at power lines, pipelines, roads, bridges, the farmers that, feel, uh, that clear fields, um, sand and gravel plants. I mean, they're all, it's, it, the material is all over the place if you're just willing to hunt it. Uh, we call ourselves tree buzzards because constantly we're just looking around for trees that are going down. And, um, and we're able to take something like that and preserve it and with some creativity, turn it into um, a job, you know, for me and about 10 other people. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun big game that we all get to play and use something um, from the earth and turn it into something. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of what we do. When we met, you talked about your first slab of wood being as good as the slabs that you have coming out now. And I think in this town and many technology towns, it's, it's like make quick things real quick and then improve, improve, improve. This guy made it perfect from the start and then he optimized, 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 optimized. So if you want to think about a different way to do business, come talk to him about that. And I think that we all could learn a, a little bit about not always doing it the same way as technology companies do it. So for sharing all of your uh, wisdom here today, 10 years worth at least, and uh, for uh, doing good by our Central Texas trees and the creative community. We want to thank Brandon for being here.